Um, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, panel. Um, I am uh, Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center. Want to welcome many good friends in the audience. Have to recognize one, and that's Tara Sunshine, who is the director of USIP, our friendly competitor down the road. And soon, Senate willing, will have a, a certain job in the U.S. State Department for which she is supremely qualified. More later. Uh, but welcome, Tara, and, well, yeah, and welcome to many good friends. Um, this event uh, is to help the SAGE initiative uh, spread its wings. Would that be about it? Spread its wings. Uh, and several very, very uh, dear friends are here to, to join uh, uh, Goli, uh, uh, Mary, and Brad uh, uh, to Minnick to do that, and they are Paula Dobriansky, who will discuss why SAGE is good for business, and Anne-Marie Slaughter, who will focus on why SAGE is good for government, and we just all know in this audience and on this panel that SAGE is good for good, so that, that point has been made. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, Goli Ameri, uh, who, uh, who is the uh, former Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs, uh, and credit her as the real mastermind, yes, uh, behind the project. Uh, as is so often the case, it was a group of uh, talented women who brought this project to fruition. <laughs> but we must also acknowledge uh, Brad Minnick and the role Aww. that he played in uh, uh, <laughs> developing the project here at the Wilson Center. Uh, at the Wilson Center, we take our role as uh, uh, seriously as, as a bridge between the worlds of ideas and public policy uh, to inform and develop solutions to the nation's problems and challenges. And as uh, Woodrow Wilson said uh, 110 years ago, try that. Is that possible? Yeah, I guess that is possible. He would have been an academic, yes. We are not put into the world to sit and know. We are put in it to act. In this spirit, we were proud to serve as the convener of today's, we are proud to serve as the convener of today's session, and we are also uh, proud to, to serve as the, um, a, as the place that supported the development of this business plan. Uh, following today's meeting, Goley and Brad and others will take SAGE to its new home, TBD, and its new form, which will be a 501c3, and its new funders, who will be very generous. And we will hear news about that soon. Uh, but before turning the program over to Paula, I think it is Paula, I, I do want to acknowledge one other person, a uh, shy retiring guy with a money tie on him over there in the back, uh, looking embarrassed, and that's Mike Van Dusen, because I do know, uh, all of you know Mike, uh, Mike runs this place, and Mike was there. Uh, I was not yet here uh, when uh, he and Brad and others worked out the plan and goalie uh, to have Wilson um, help birth this thing. And so uh, as a mother of four actual children, I'm happy to have a, uh, a virtual child uh, to welcome today. And uh, now I think my role is to ask Paula, uh, who also has had legendary careers both in academia and um, the consulting sector and the State Department to take this over. And let me just finally comment about Paula. Um, when, uh, during my many years in Congress, uh, when I needed a, um, I, I needed to, a grounding in what the State Department was thinking and doing, and, uh, and even before that, I think. I think I knew Paula before she was in, yes, I did. Council on Foreign Relations, that's where it started. I would call Paula, and uh, you may or may not know that Paula and I are in different political parties. It never mattered. And I think that that is what the Wilson Center stands for. It doesn't matter. What we stand for is good people coming together to make good policy, and uh, certainly SAGE and what SAGE will lead to in the public diplomacy space will be a convening of good people, hopefully to make good policy at a time when the world 
cries out for a renewed and perhaps evolved public policy role by our country. So I think this is timely, uh, and I think uh, Paula just exemplifies the kind of person uh, who who knows and understands public policy and whose values and interests align with what's best for our country. So please welcome my friend, Paula Dobriansky. Thank you so much. Jane, thank you so much, and thank you very, very much to you, your leadership, that of Michael Van Dusen and the Wilson Center for certainly uh, being the strategic partner of, uh, of SAGE. Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, I, too, I'd like to uh, not only thank the Wilson Center and its uh, dynamic leadership team, but also to acknowledge the vision of Golia Mary uh, in this initiative and uh, the dedication, commitment of uh, Brad uh, Minnick. And as I look out across the room, you know, there are so many people in this room who are public diplomacy aficionados um, uh, in so many different ways and very committed to the whole Im importance and issue of public diplomacy and who are part of this effort or will be partners of this effort. So thank you for coming today. And I'm delighted to be uh, the uh, partner um, uh, in at least launching the two parts of uh, the topic this morning. Uh, I will be focusing on business and how business relates to SAGE. And Anne-Marie, uh, whom is all, uh, known to all of you, uh, will be focusing on uh, why SAGE is important to policymakers. Let me say a few words first just about the mission. The mission of SAGE is, in, in my view, a very simple one. You know, public diplomacy is so critical in everything that we do. In government, you could have good policy. But if your policies are not well understood by foreign audiences, then the impact of it is not going to be so meaningful. Well, you could transfer that over to businesses. There are two parts to this of why uh, SAGE matters for businesses and why businesses have something also certainly to offer to uh, SAGE in this, uh, in this uh, regard. The first being how critical um, businesses are in terms of innovation, in terms of new technologies, and also I would uh, put forth the importance that businesses bring to the table in terms of what we know as public-private partnerships. You can have governmental tracks, and governmental tracks can get through certain sectors, but as we all know, there are times where access is limited, and actually the business sector, the private sector can have a much greater impact. So there's a nexus here in terms of what businesses certainly bring to the table in terms of innovation, creative ideas, the application of new technologies and being able to better communicate and more effectively communicate and advance strategic communications, and then no less public-private partnerships. So here the question is, what can SAGE do to assist our businesses, and what can our companies do to advance the goals of SAGE? First, I'd start with the fact that we all know that companies have uh, uh, customers, uh, employees, business partners across the globe. Well. Right up, front, right up front, the mandate is very much the same. It's synergistic. In terms of what SAGE seeks to achieve, it is reaching out to those audiences abroad who, by the way, do comprise the base of customers, business partners, employees, and the mandate is the same. Effective communications, getting your messages across, and here in this case, I'd just start with that basic point. Businesses really have a stake here because greater effective communication is going to mean better business, um, uh, uh, being able to garner your uh, support of your, not only your employees, but your business partners, and also a more conducive environment within which to operate. And SAGE brings that by the very mandate of which it has launched. Um, the second uh, component that I'd put on the table is stability of one's environment. 
Businesses uh, are uh, always looking for stable environments within which to operate, some predictability, and also transparency. That's where SAGE also has another, I think, very critical nexus here. The stability, transparency, also even the importance of, I would say, um, which is uppermost on the minds of many corporations, and that are clear mandates in terms of rule of law, what are, uh, what are the ground rules for operating. So here, flipping back to literally what uh, the mission of SAGE is, as you look through uh, the uh, booklet uh, that you have before you, you'll see very clearly in terms of the stated, uh, in, uh, in terms of the stated mission, that basically uh, SAGE is geared towards stabilizing international relationships, which are important to U.S. competitiveness and economic stability. Let's also look at a third factor, and that's interconnectedness. Certainly in terms of business, um, uh, businesses operate and structure their own business plans because of an interconnectedness. Here in this vein as well, public diplomacy, advanced communications, strategic communications, it is about com uh, interconnectedness. We know, just take for example the European debt crisis. Um, basically, it's an issue that certainly resonates with a lot of companies and corporations following. What are the ramifications of it? What will it mean for us? It just underscores how interconnected we are. Also, let me mention that basically SAGE will afford companies new opportunities, basically put them in front of new um, uh, or non-traditional audiences, and basically leverage other resources while building new relationships. I think it could be uh, uh, clearly stated that SAGE provides a kind of a mechanism and a platform um, by its uh, private sector component for actually advancing relationships, growing environments that are conducive to business growth. And then let me mention just two other factors and um, sum up. And that is um, corporate engagement also adds another dynamic to how people and countries abroad learn about American values. This is now the flip side. I've described for you in many ways how uh, SAGE provides a good platform and connectivity with businesses. But let me give you the flip of what businesses also, why they have a stake in SAGE and what they could bring to the table. We all know corporate social responsibility, the whole essence of it, and how critical it is. Uh, you have corporations that are essentially the face of the United States uh, when acting abroad. What they do, the policies that uh, they pursue, the mandate that they have, what uh, policies they have for their own employees and their relationships with their customers. So here, actually, it is the face in many ways of American values and what we are all about. And in this sense, I think that businesses have a very active role to play in this because of that very fact. Um, uh, I know from having been under Secretary for Global Affairs that you have so many companies that either engage with human rights issues or engage with trafficking in persons issues abroad or engage with curtailing narcotics trafficking or HIV AIDS or other infectious diseases or science diplomacy. I could go on with so many different sectors of where companies have invested their monies in these areas and they literally have a voice themselves abroad. So here in this case, the flip side is businesses also have a lot to bring to this initiative. And that's where finally public-private uh, partnerships come into play. I mentioned it before. Basically, in public-private partnerships, businesses do bring and can bring added resources to the table. Um, certainly here uh, uh, also businesses can undertake efforts that sometimes governments aren't necessarily best positioned to do and also that um, uh, governments may not be the most effective voice on. So in this sense, I would say that particularly the um, uh, dimension where businesses have a lot to bring to this initiative, or certainly in terms of public-private partnerships. So in sum, there's a very natural synergistic relationship here uh, between SAGE and businesses, and that I think will be very mutually beneficial as this initiative goes forward. And I'd say uh, I look very much forward to contributing to, and I'm sure that all of you in this audience do as well. 
So with that, let me uh, stop there and um, uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Anne Marie Slaughter to uh, make the case for why it's important to policymakers. Great. Thank you. Paula and I have been partnering ever since I was the chair of the term membership committee on the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, and we were making sure that a bipartisan range of members uh, was admitted, and we're still at it. So it's <laughs> particularly nice uh, to be here, uh, and also at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Jane, that would be Woodrow Wilson, an academic at Princeton University, when he said that, and uh, <laughs> just, just to remind everybody. Uh, but uh, honestly, uh, this is uh, the kind of project where we actually see ideas moving from academia to think tanks to reality, and the Woodrow Wilson Center has played a critical incubating role. One of the things, if you read the SAGE report, you will note is that something like 10 reports uh, recommended this kind of initiative uh, outside government on public diplomacy. I'm looking at Kristen Lord. Hers was one uh, for the, uh, the Center uh, for a New American Security, but there are many others, and again, they come from across the political spectrum. So we're actually here seeing an idea that has been put forward by commissions, that's put forward by reports, that's actually now going to become a reality. I think one place to start looking at uh, our future Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy, as I firmly believe she will soon be, uh, is to talk about the, co the definition of public diplomacy that this initiative will uh, help establish and embed. And public diplomacy is always getting redefined and expanded, and it's I think most people think of it as primarily uh, in broadcast mode. If you just ask somebody, you know, what's public diplomacy, they'll talk about Voice of America or Radio Free Europe or the former activities of the U.S. Information Agency, getting great information about the United States out there in the world. But again, under both uh, administrations of both parties, that – definition has expanded to uh, all sorts of exchanges, society to society exchanges. Most, most uh, well known, of course, are Fulbrights and the Fulbright scholars that we send all around the world and they, uh, as a, a tremendous uh, advertisement for the United States, but, but equally importantly engaging people uh, around the world. Uh, so that there are exchanges of all kinds, educational exchanges, information exchanges, and now, more than ever, public diplomacy is about building relationships. It's about listening and engaging uh, and partnering as much as it is broadcasting what we do. In the Under Secretary Clinton, that definition has expanded to include what Secretary Clinton calls 21st century statecraft. And the, I'm currently teaching a seminar on 21st century statecraft or a policy conference. I have 16 really bright young Princeton juniors who are all researching different dimensions of 21st century statecraft. One of the things is, that is extraordinary now that I have 16 really good research assistants is to see how much is actually being done uh, in various categories. And I want to talk a little bit about that and then about how SAGE is going to, to uh, strengthen and expand those activities. Uh, so – a way to think about 21st century statecraft is that it's about connecting government to society and society to society using technology, public-private partnerships, uh, and global networks to advance U.S. foreign policy goals and to solve global problems. So in many ways, that is a broader definition uh, of public diplomacy, uh, but it has some very specific dimensions. And the first is this idea of government to society engagement. So under Secretary Clinton, you've seen the appointment of a, an ambassador for global women's issues, an ambassador for the Global Partnership Initiative, which is public-private partnerships, a special representative for civil society. For the first time ever, the U.S. government is conducting a strategic dialogue with civil society. We have 50 strategic dialogues or partnerships with other nations. We've never had a strategic dialogue with a huge segment of society around the world. She has a special representative uh, for youth, global youth affairs. Uh, this uh, 
extraordinary young person, is actually working with ambassadors all over the world to set up youth councils at all of our different embassies, councils of local youth, uh, who are then advising the ambassador on how to engage young people. And obviously in the Middle East, where 60% of the population is under 30, uh, and there are many African and South Asian countries where the demographics look similar, it's very important that we are specifically targeting youth. Uh, one recent uh, uh, outcome of this youth council is that our Cairo embassy is running the equivalent of an American idol uh, for the best Muslim wo woman singer. Now, that, uh, that is not the way we normally think of the U.S. in the Middle East. I think we could well afford to have it be a little more. We are pioneers in all sorts of uh, different ways. But we also have a special outreach to entrepreneurs uh, and special outreach to Muslim uh, communities around the world. These are all different ways of engaging segments of society. So if you think about traditional diplomacy as divided in terms of regions of the world and functional issues, now it's increasingly divided in terms of demographics of different segments of society, and we're going to have to think about it uh, that way. Second broad area, as Paula said, is absolutely public-private partnerships. Uh, the N Obama National Security Strategy mentions public-private partnerships over 30 times. That's remarkable for a national security strategy. And that's just recognizing that we can accomplish our foreign policy goals just relying on government. We have to mobilize all of society. Public-private partnerships includes the private sector, but also the civic sector. It includes global alliances around health issues, uh, as well as anti-corruption, uh, as well as building fragile states, a whole set of things where government is indispensable, but you can't do it with government alone. And the third broad area is all around technology. And it's really exciting to think of government as being a technology innovator. But the State Department has run technology delegations to Iraq, to Russia, to Brazil. Uh, I led one to Liberia and Sierra Leone a year ago, taking people from Google and Twitter and the cell phone associations uh, and NGOs that use technology to develop micro jobs for people around the world to meet with governments in Africa and other countries, uh, to meet with the private sector and with NGOs to see how technology which is our brand, our U.S. brand, can be used to solve a whole range of problems. We run tech camps for NGOs in over 30 countries. This, again, uh, the, the State Department does. We have tech at state conferences where we bring together leading technologists uh, and, again, pe public policy practitioners, NGOs, and private corporations around specific subjects like mobile money uh, or uh, global, how you can use technology uh, to advance global health. So if this is what government is now doing, if this is the broader definition of public diplomacy, and honestly, uh, when Tara is, is uh, uh, confirmed, uh, I think going forward, all these different initiatives have to be brought within one part of the State Department uh, to really broaden our capacity for engaging society and for connecting society to society. And SAGE is an absolutely critical partner because there are things that even if the State Department, you know, can do everything it needs to do and can be maximally effective working with USAID, with DOD, with other parts of the U.S. government, there's still all sorts of things it can't do, either for security reasons in some cases, political constraints, resource constraints. So the State Department has worked very hard to partner with the private sector on resources, but there are obviously any number of ways in which an initiative like SAGE, which is an independent 501c3 with bipartisan support, can get more resources, can pilot all sorts of programs uh, that government might not be able to do at the outset, and then be a partner to amplify what government's doing, but add its own uh, projects uh, to increase the impact of what government is doing, but again, with the independence uh, and the resources that being uh, something like SAGE will actually uh, bring. Uh, that is... Uh, in many ways, what the concept of the National Endowment for Democracy was, with you have the undersecretary, the Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and then you have the National Endowment for Democracy, which of course has the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute. That's great. 
This is even better, in my view, because this will not be congressionally funded. There is not the problem of competition and the question of, well, who's really representing the U.S. government? This will be an independent entity that will get its funding from foundations, from business, from private donors, uh, and then will be a genuine partner uh, with government in a way, again, that allows it to do things that government can't do or to do more than government uh, can do, uh, but that really does amplify government and achieve government's overall goals of, again, connecting to society, connecting society to society, and advancing uh, U.S. values around the world. And that's where I want to end, coming back to what Paula said. I really do think uh, there, there are two dimensions here that are very important to, to underline. And again, looking out at you, I, I see uh, friends across the political spectrum. This is a bipartisan initiative. This says to the world, hey, you know, actually, American society, American business, American government can come together uh, to n not just advertise what is good about the United States, but to engage people around the world in what we think are American values, but part of the American birthright is thinking they're universal values. So engaging people in defining what human rights mean around the world. Uh, and there are many differences in degree. There's a fundamental corpus of human rights, but how they're implemented, how they're understood in different countries, that's something we need to engage others uh, on. Uh, in, then in promoting those values and standing for them in however we can. And that includes solving a whole range of problems, the problems of poverty, the problems of women's empowerment, the problems of uh, open, transparent, and accountable government, the problems of basic order in societies around the world. Those are all things that these, this kind of initiative can help mobilize the funding for uh, and promote. Uh, around the world. So this idea of a bipartisan venture, bipartisan because it's not tied to any one administration and because it has bipartisan support, uh, engaging societies, bringing societies uh, together in the service of universal values uh, is uh, a tremendous mission and SAGE is an actual uh, operational uh, entity that has been uh, transformed from the idea, from the reports of commissions and think tanks uh, to implementation with the help of the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my job this morning is just to give you a quick overview for those of you who have, who have not yet uh, consumed the entire, digested the entire uh, business plan. Uh, it's nice to know that there are other things going on in Washington today besides the health care debate. Uh, we launched this effort in September of 2010 with a volunteer working group which grew to over 80 uh, members, um, all of whom were volunteers, and they're from across the country, from across the ideological spectrum, and uh, from across business sectors. It was truly a team effort, and here's the mission statement that the team formulated to foster engagement between U.S. society and the rest of the world with a view to promoting shared values and common interests, increasing mutual understanding and respect, and enhancing America's standing in the world. Uh, one of our working group members, Joe Nye, uh, has made the point that part of the new public diplomacy is building relationships with civil society actors in other countries and facilitating networks uh, between non-governmental parties at home and abroad. That's why one of SAGE's proposed initiatives is to undertake an unprecedented effort to drive and support large-scale, sustainable people-to-people -people diplomacy between Americans and foreign audiences. Uh, we call that initiative in the plan, I Hear You, because we need to listen more as Americans, not just talk. Uh, and it will be, it's designed to be a virtual network of cyber diplomats who will be developing ongoing relationships with people around the world and productive collaborations on global issues of mutual concern. Another priority, promoting moderate voices to counter 
violent extremism and ideologies. Uh, for example, by connecting anti-extremist writers and thinkers from around the world, by or supporting translation or distribution of controversial works that perhaps the government would not be able to underwrite, or by developing original programs or productions. A third priority, promoting the application of new technology for public diplomacy purposes. I mean, think of the possibilities, this age in which we live, uh, an on-person device that instantly translates what you're saying or writing uh, into any of the 6,000 languages on this planet. Uh, contact lenses with internet connections capable of display displaying subtitles in the wearer's field of vision. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> uh, printing in three dimensions, uh, actually being in a video game, if you can imagine. Sage, SAGE aims to invest in technologies with potential public diplomacy applications, a sort of uh, VC fund, if you will, for public diplomacy, and some of those technologies will fail. But again, by not being a part of the government, it's a little easier to uh, invest in something that might not work out completely as you had hoped it would. Uh, there are plenty of organizations that focus on promoting free and independent journalism. SAGE does not propose to duplicate their efforts. Uh, what it does propose to do, however, is help bolster the business side of free and independent journalism. Uh, quite frankly, there are thousands of journalists all over the world who are learning how to research and to uh, source, to investigate, and to report stories. But many of them know very little, if anything, about running a sustainable, prof profitable media enterprise. SAGE aims to promote sustainable independent media entities in the developing world. And a final SAGE priority, promote public-private partnerships and the free exchange of ideas and information between public and private sectors. There was a GIO report in 2007 that, that noted that the efforts to coordinate and share audience research data are hampered, among other things, by the, by the fact that there's no dedicated forum to periodically bring people together for this purpose. The SAGE plan calls for creation of a research council of private and public sector researchers specifically for this purpose. Just think of the billions of dollars that the U.S. multinationals spend every year on overseas market research and audience research. Why not provide a mechanism to share non-proprietary information between the government and the private sector in a pu for public diplomacy purposes. SAGE could also become the administration transcending permanent home for planning America's participation in, in future world expositions. Why does that matter? Well, think uh, at the Shanghai uh, um, uh, World uh, Exhibition, sorry, Shanghai Exhibition last, uh, in 2010, 7 million people went through the U.S. Pavilion, which happened to be designed by a Canadian. Uh, and the pavilion itself got m mixed reviews. Well, rather than reinventing the wheel every single time by having to put out a contract and, and, and go around with a tin cup to the private sector to fund a, uh, a pavilion, why not have a secretariat someplace that is constantly thinking about this and, and developing public-private partnerships to help put our very best foot forward uh, at such, when such public diplomacy opportunities uh, present themselves. Well, will SAGE do all these things? Uh, probably not in the end, especially with the initial budget that we're talking about. Uh, but what it proposes to do are critical niches that are unfilled at the moment. And the whole point is to get SAGE up and operational because it's – it will be flexible, flexibility in terms of projects, people, and ultimately its priorities. And as you've heard, it will be independent of government with no intention to be a competitor to government. It will not duplicate or hinder government or non-governmental initiatives. For example, I think 
there, there's no um, desire on the part of SAGE to get involved with uh, public diplomacy exchanges. There are a lot of terrific organizations in this town that partner with the State Department already to do that type of thing. But there are things, as, as um, Anne Marie mentioned, and uh, as Paula mentioned, that are difficult for the government to do, like retaining the long view, like adapting quickly to changing circumstances, investing in high-risk enterprises, partnering with civil society organizations, both domestic and international, uh, that may be hesitant to work with the government. So being flexible with respect to procurement and business conduct and having organizational and programmatic flexibility, political autonomy, and entrepreneurial and innovative staff in a streamlined decision-making process. Uh, SAGE will not be limited to advocating uh, U.S. positions, but is designed to transcend administrations so that it can support initiatives that otherwise might not survive a change from one administration to the next, or quite frankly, from one senior policy maker to the next within an administration. And as proof of concept, the working group identified four priority countries, Egypt, Pakistan, Russia, and Turkey. Before closing, let me just mention briefly the SAGE business model and budget and where the resources will come from. The working group debated at length the best structure to accomplish its mission for SAGE, how to allocate resources, and where the resources will come from. And the outcome was SAGE will be a 501c3 nonprofit, completely autonomous from politics and government, primarily but not exclusively a grant-making organization, an organization that's extremely cognizant not to overburden grantees with reporting requirements that impede the actual work that must get done. It will also reserve the right to streamline, streamline the awards process. The budget, the big question was go big or get real. Given the current fiscal environment, the consensus was to start small with a startup budget of $10 million. Unfortunately, there is not a super PAC yet for public diplomacy. 85% uh, of the revenues will be spent on programs. And where will those resources come from? We're looking for private sector funding from companies, foundations, and individuals. Raising $10 million from these sources for public diplomacy purposes in this environment will not be easy, we know that. <laughs> but it's time for U.S. corporations and foundations and individuals to uh, step up to the plate, I would suggest to you. We have corporations, for example, that have a dedicated retail presence around the world, and like it or not, they are perceived to be American companies, and we invite them to join us in this effort to help improve America's uh, standing around the world. Many private foundations, as you will recall, um, made sustained efforts during the Cold War, and we invite them to do the same now. This is no less of a critical time. And American citizens through SAGE will have a way to actively develop and participate in critical initiatives of national importance without endorsing specific political agendas or, or policies. You know, the people in this room and watching across the country, you can make this happen. You can get it done. Goalie's going to talk a little bit about that next. Let me just close by, as the project director, by extending a sincere thank you to the working group. As I said, uh, more than 80 folks, all volunteers, who despite their crazy schedules, believed in this cause and produced this plan. And a special shout out to our subcommittee chairs, Ambassador Barbara Barrett and uh, John Marks, the president of Search for Common Ground, who handled development. Uh, Christy Carpenter, the CEO of the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute, Institute in Arkansas, who handled programs. Ambassador Jim Dobbins down in the front here, who was our governance subcommittee chair. Susan Geely, who's over here, who handled our target market subcommittee. And Cindy Williams, a research scientist from MIT, who was our budget chair. They did an incredible job. I want to thank the executive board reviewers, including Congressman Fortenberry and Senator Ben Cardin, and of course our foundation funders. I want to say thank you again to Jane Harmon in the Wilson Center and uh, for serving as the venue for this project, and particularly to thank uh, Jane Harmon, my office mate for much of this project who helped make today possible, and Mike Van Dusen, the executive vice president here, one of the busiest people here who always 
made time for SAGE and has been a devoted uh, supporter from day one. We really appreciate that. So thank you, Paula and Anne-Marie, for your enthusiastic support. Thank you, Goli, for your vision, your steadfastness, and your refusal to take no for an answer. <laughs> and uh, thank all of you for being here, for your interest, and hopefully as you leave today, your support going forward. We can get this done, even in partisan Washington, even in an election year. We just have to do it. Thank you. Well, um, Brad, thank you very much. Um, I, I really am delighted to have the opportunity to say a huge thank you to you because you're actually the one that took this project from where, you know, bringing the people together to actually developing this plan and putting it together. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted that you took an opportunity to thank um, the working group and, and the chairs. And if it's if at all possible, can we have a show of hands of all the working group members that are in the audience today? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I know our, our um, co-chairs, and I know Master Dobbins is here and Susan is here. Is any of the other co-chairs here today? I mean, I just want to add to what um, Brad said. This was a lot of work that you all did. Thank you so much. Really. Based on your, based on volunteerism and and just believing in the, in the concept, so much appreciated. Thank you very much, and of course, um, want to give a huge thank you to Congresswoman Harmon who walked into the Wilson Center and really took this project under her wings. Um, really much appreciated, and of course to Congressman Lee Hamilton who was the one that um, understood the concept of Sage right away and is really the one that decided that w Wilson Center would uh, would support it. And of course, last but by no means least, Mike, thank you very much. If it wasn't for you, this project would not be where it is today. You really gave it everything that you had. Thank you. And a huge thanks to Dr. Esfandieri, who actually introduced us to Mike to, to host this um, at the Wilson Center. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is what are our next steps. But you know, I, um, I saw this concert by, um, with a piece by Antonin Dvorak a few weeks ago, and there was a quote um, from him in the, um, you know, in the, in the playbill that said, um, to have a fine idea is nothing special, but to develop the idea and make something great of it, that's the hardest part. That's art. And you know, Dvorak had all sorts of reasons for, for, for saying this because he really had a very difficult time getting his start um, in life. As a Czech in a very Germanocentric uh, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century Europe, um, he really had a very hard time making a living. Um, but he had three things going for him. One was he had um, perseverance and an intense belief that his music was unique and, and different. And in a way, it really was. He did this grand orchestral pieces that had a tremendous amount of influence from Czech folk music. And uh, he also, he had a very good champion. Brahms decided to take him under his, his wing. And thirdly, he had his audience. It just so turned out that audiences in the U.S. and the U.K. just ended up adoring his music. So in many ways, that made me think of, of Sage. Um, you know, Sage's success has been and will continue to be, as Brad mentioned, the fact that it really is a fine idea. It's a powerful idea whose time has come. Um, we talk about our, um, our, our sponsors, our, our supporters. We've had 80 amazing individuals involved in putting this business plan together. I don't think you will see any startup, all of the ones that end up having huge IPOs, have the caliber and the level of people that have been involved in putting Sage um, together. And then, of course, you know, we've had our executive board, two of which are sitting on this panel with me, Secretaries Rice and Perry, who lent their name to this project, and then, of course, our co-chairs that we just um, talked about. And then, of course, our audience we know is strong, as evidenced by all of you sitting in this room today and as evidenced by the preliminary results of our outreach, which I'll be talking about in a minute. So what are our requirements for success? You know, we've put a great business plan together, something that any startup operation needs. 
What is it that we need at this point in time to, that defines success for us? So obviously, the first and foremost is raising the necessary funds, because without the funds, this organization is not going to go anywhere. Secondly, is finding ways to take advantage, as Anne-Marie said, of the ingenuity of the private sector and finding technologically savvy and innovatively entertaining ways of connecting with large audiences. And thirdly, is having this organization be housed at an organization that can complement SAGE and provide, provide it with a strong network. So Southern California is um, home to over 10,000 high-tech companies. And, it's, um, and also the creative industries of film, television, music, and um, video games. The University of Southern California Annenberg School of Communications enjoys a very close relationship with all of these sectors. USC also has the largest number of foreign students in the United States. And it um, has the Public Diplomacy Center, as many of you know. The Annenberg School also has a variety of different centers, the Center for Digital Future, the Innovation Lab, the Program on Online Communities, the Research Network on International Communications. All of these different um, entities at the Annenberg School are basically there to understand how online communities work, how to take best advantage of them, how to bring people together, and basically how to use technology for um, civic purposes. So the great news today that I would like to announce is that the University of Southern California has expressed interest to collaborate with SAGE and to house and incubate SAGE with the caveat that we could actually raise the funds for this organization. Um, I think Annenberg can bring a tremendous amount to SAGE, and we really hope that SAGE can do the same thing for Annenberg, USC, and of course the Public Diplomacy Center. The PD Center could um, get engaged in the evaluation of programs and, and research that is going to be necessary, part of SAGE. The Research Advisory Group of SAGE could be part of the PD Center Fellows. Of course, um, USC has a Master's in Public Diplomacy and we really hope to be able to take advantage of the graduates of the center as interns. Um, for SAGE and obviously lowering, uh, lowering our costs. So that is, um, that is the first piece of news that I wanted to share with you. And of course, you know, we need to figure out all of the details as part of the phase two of SAGE. There have been other instances where there's, there have been independent organizations housed with universities sort of at an arm's length that have their own governance and their own autonomy. That's all the stuff that we need to figure out. Um, now, getting to the topic of, of fundraising. Um, we, we've actually learned quite a bit about the world of fundraising for SAGE in the last few months since the end of the um, development of the business plan. And I'm very pleased to announce um, two very important developments today. The first one, which I'm actually very excited about, is that we are now in the process of developing um, a proposal for a family foundation um, that, uh, where the proposal is actually due in May that has expressed serious interest um, in sponsoring and supporting SAGE. We also have a $100,000 matching grant from an anonymous donor at this point in time. And we are in discussions with three other foundations and high net worth individuals to find ways to match SAGE's um, uh, you know, list of priorities, as Brad mentioned, with their areas of um, interest. One of the other things that we've also learned about companies is that they are interested in supporting and so sponsoring discrete projects. It is difficult to ask companies to come and fund SAGE when we don't have discrete projects to talk to them about. But at the same time, one of the things that we've learned is that because SAGE will have a wide variety of these discrete projects, like I hear you that Brad talked about, there is a very strong potential in working closely with the entertainment and uh, technology industries. So I'd like to call all of you to please remain involved. Um, 
Sage has come this far because of the brains that have been behind it. It will go further if we keep all of these brains engaged and, and uh, further involved. Um, I'd like to ask um, any of you who are interested to please join us at this present at the Creation Legacy Committee, which is going to be the fundraising arm and the fundraising help for uh, the new organization. And of course, you know, from this point, point on, other than figuring out the fundraising bit, which, we'll, which really will be the most important thing that we're going to focus on, and of course, figuring out the way we can work with USC once we bring in the first um, tranche of funding, is obviously recruiting the, the board members, um, incorporating the organization as a 501c3, as Brad mentioned, and beginning to recruit the advisory council. So once again, I want to really thank all of you for your involvement in this project, and really our hope is that you will remain engaged and you will make this a priority. Thank you. We, we have time, about 10 minutes, uh, if there are questions that I would like to ask, starting with the gentleman over here. We do have a microphone. We, but if you if you speak into the microphone, though, then it can be captured for, for posterity. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Mark Leon with the Voice America Creative Foundation, and it is a pleasure to see all of you and to go over the wall today. We have the great pleasure to go over the wall and say hi. We've been on fire about. Okay. I'm George, uh, Georgetown University's Mark Lagon. Um, first, how central is democracy and democracy promotion uh, to this whole effort? And I'm really confident that this is going to be a transformative uh, model and you uh, use all the nimbleness of public-private partnerships. What do you think is the single thing that you need to do um, to make sure it's a transformative set of public-private partnerships rather than kind of cotton candy partnership, fluffy, pretty, sweet, mostly air. Okay. I'll jump in, may I, on the first one. Uh, uh, Ambassador Jim Dobbins is sitting in front and he was uh, overseeing our governance uh, a committee of which I was part of. And governance takes several different forms, governance for the effort, but also, by the way, uh, thematically, uh, we also, I feel we also had a discussion about the whole importance of uh, governance and values and the promotion of values. Uh, my, my own answer to this is I think uh, the whole advancement of democracy is very central because we are talking about the foundation of American values. Um, but I also think what is creative here is, as all uh, on this uh, panel have underscored, you know, it's not being done through a governmental channel, and it's also not being done uh, in a non-collaborative way. I think that the emphasis and the premium is on engagement, and by the way, as we know, we're not the only ones with an experience. It has to be a collaborative effort, and we will be able to actually have, I think, the greatest amount of impact by um, uh, not just doing this in a unilateral context, but more in a cooperative and, uh, um, uh, uh, to use the word, multilateral context. Um, it is a central theme, and it undergirds, I think, the very essence of this initiative. Can I take a crack at this? Sure. So I agree with that. I also think to the extent we're, we're pushing technology uh, hard, uh, that is exactly advancing democratic values. I mean, it, obviously technology can be used to suppress just as it, must, it, it can deliberate, but part of what, w what we would be emphasizing is, is keeping the technology of liberation ahead of the technology uh, of suppression. Uh, 
the other thing I would say on your question then about public-private partnerships, I think it would be very important to get a couple partnerships with one or two of the big technology companies. Part of what we need to do is associate the U.S. brand precisely with our science and technology and make this about some of our leading edge corporations seeing a huge advantage in doing this for what they do in the world, but more broadly for making the world a better place for them to do it. Uh, and there, I think, if we can do that, uh, it w they will be very substantive partnerships and they'll set the tone for others. I would just make one comment on that, which is uh, the key to the public-private partnerships is to have a real partner on both sides yeah, of the too. equation uh, so that going forward the, the um, partnership can be sustainable. And one of the challenges I found it when I was serving in the State Department was it, with everything constantly changing, it's difficult to be focused on actually sustaining the partnership, especially from one administration to the next. So what we uh, hope to do here is to, to identify on the side of the private sector partners the person responsible who cares about this, who will make it happen. We have a similar person on our side, and together we develop a, a, a true partnership that's sustainable. Also, if I could just jump in, because you're also, you asked the question, what would be transformative? And uh, I would agree completely with uh, Anne Marie. Um, there's a nexus of a number of issues uh, for many of us I in this room who've been involved in public diplomacy over the years. I think there were some very traditional elements that had been used and reused. And we're obviously at a different point in time. And uh, clearly the importance of technology matters here, innovation matters here, and that's why uh, I'm a very strong believer that the business community does have a lot to do in this lane. And it's not just only the Internet uh, a side of it and the communication side. There are so many other different sectors in the business community that have such a vested interest. But a second point is there's also a number of issues that haven't always come together so completely and fully in the past. Democracy, science, health, technology, all of these have a relationship and in some non-traditional ways of promoting values, getting across messages in very creative ways. Take science, for example. Just the very nature of uh, science diplomacy, there's transparency. You don't have to state it, uh, the way in which scientists engage. So there are some core messages, and I think that uh, SAGE will be very much seeking to make it its business to unearth those and to target those. You had a question right here? This is Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid, National Director of the Islamic Society of North America. I just met Brad nine months ago and I want to congratulate him that he delivered on time. <laughs> 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 so as the Muslim community in North America with its vibrancy, with its connections and particularly the diaspora, 30% of our diaspora is from the countries that you are focusing on. Already we have been doing this in smaller scale. Our sons and daughters are involved in a very scientific way in delivering uh, technology and ideas and so on. So we welcome this. This is wonderful. So I want to see that more of our diaspora, more of the Islamic side of North America, our resources, they are utilized for this kind of great work. Thank you. Uh, we had a question in the back there. You had your hand up, sir. Yes. Hello. Yeah. My name is Wilfred Eckstein. I'm uh, new to Washington. I'm from the Goethe Institute. The Goethe Institute is the German cultural center in a lot of countries and here for almost 20 years. Um, I worked 10 years in Russia and uh, some other countries also later on and the last three years in Shanghai. So I was very much aware of the uh, expo, whatever, adventure. Um, I would like to raise the question about uh, culture. We have been wondering at the Goethe Institute, especially here and also in Cairo, in Moscow, what is the role of America in culture? Germany has uh, some interesting experience after the end of the war 
with America houses and things like that, which really helped to develop democracy, but also brought an interesting cultural aspect to it. You mentioned science, you mentioned health and all the other issues. You believe in technology. Um, some of your um, words, um, Professor Slaughter, reminded me very much of China, except the value system. But of course, China has Not already... a small accept. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a very big accept. But the question is, where? how can you make it appear? Because also China, the, the, um, the Chinese uh, Communist Party, has started to reach out to society by internet, by bloggers. And that is a very interesting and very appealing thing uh, and dangerous as well. So my question is, where does culture come in? Okay, let me take one more right there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Jennifer Golden. I was the project director on the um, original Council on Foreign Relations Task Force in which Pe Pete Peterson conceived of the idea of a corporation <laughs> for public diplomacy. Um, just in reflection, I was thinking that was 10 years ago. And so for me, that was a marriage, two kids, and three jobs ago. So it's exciting <laughs> to see this actually moving forward. I just had one comment. It struck me um, as you were talking about sort of the, the business plan for SAGE and, and the activities that it will undertake. One idea um, that I'd just like to propose to you that I think would be relatively cost, effect, uh, cost effective is just um, the organization acting as a clearinghouse for the different kinds of public diplomacy activities that are already being undertaken either within government or even within the um, sort of public sector. I know when we were originally looking at this, just in terms of funding, it was a it's a very hazy uh, maze to try to navigate who was doing what, even just within the U.S. government. So um, I think that would be an activity that could be done relatively cheaply and, and would, would be uh, very cost effective. Thank you. Comment on the question about culture? I'll, <laughs> I'll take a crack. You know, this actually does go back to Mark Legon's question about uh, how you – promote democracy without having that be your top line uh, immediately. Because I, I've thought a lot about what the Chinese are doing, and to some extent th there is a genuine desire to allow for more citizen participation because many, certainly local leaders, uh, mayors, know that they really aren't going to keep their jobs unless they're listening to people more and paying more attention. At the same time, China uses technology as a safety valve to maintain control rather than to actually uh, engage. So it seems to me the culture part comes in in terms of what – technology is a tool, but what's it a tool for? And in terms of, of genuine engagement, that has to be listening, but it also has to be responding and responding in a meaningful way. And that means often shifting your own views, really really paying attention not only to what your partners say in terms of your public-private partnerships, but when you're engaging with youth, when you're engaging with diff you know, entrepreneurs or different uh, sectors of society, really hearing them and changing what you do as a result. And I'll just say for me uh, as a sort of I've, I've now been on Twitter for a year, one of the things that has been most powerful is how many people, when I send something out, will come back and say, you're wrong. I'm in a regular uh, dialogue with many former members of the military, and we have very lively discussions about the use of force. But then forcing me to not just to sort of say, well, that's great, and I'm expanding my own reach, but really to hear them and really, to, really to shift. So I think the culture of democracy you wouldn't always know it from this town, uh, is a culture of hearing and compromising and actually changing and not just uh, using it to, for, uh, for a tool to advance your own interest. Unfortunately, uh, there's another group that needs this room in about 15 minutes. So we need to do the changeover, uh, which means that we have to bring this uh, program to an end. I want to thank uh, Golia Mary and Anne-Marie Slaughter and Paula Dobriansky, all of them busy people, for their time and their support. I want to thank you for being here today, and I look forward to seeing you at SAGE headquarters in California in the very near future. Thank you. <laughs>